Okay, today's lesson explores a mathematical relationship between the concentrations of the reactants and products at equilibrium. It's called the equilibrium law. And if you have a look at page 473 of your textbook, Investigation 7.2.1, and pull out your calculator, it'll probably take you about five minutes, five to seven minutes, to try the different mathematical relationships that they suggest there to find out which one produces a constant value from the concentrations that are given in the table. So I suggest you pause the video, pull out your calculator, and try those different relationships and see which mathematical relationship gives a constant. Okay, so hopefully you did that, and as you experimented with the different mathematical relationships, you found that it was actually a quotient that gave you a constant. So I've put approximately here 294. I was using the trial one data there. You'll have 293 or 295, like somewhere around there, um, allowing for experimental error. And so it turns out the quotient of the products, concentration of products over the concentration of reactants, gives you this value, this equilibrium law constant. The equilibrium law constant does change with temperature. That's the only thing that will affect it. Um, and we'll look at that after we explore Le Chatelier's principle in another lesson. So it's important then that you're able to write an equilibrium law equation. So I've given you a general equation here. Lowercase a, b, c, and d are the balancing coefficients. Capital A and B are reactants, capital C and D are products. So we write the equilibrium law equation by taking the concentrations of the products raised to the exponents of their coefficients and divide by the concentrations of the reactants raised to the exponents of their coefficients. It's important then when we use this expression that we're using equilibrium concentrations when we substitute values in here. And when you write the equilibrium law equation, you only include substances that are gases and aqueous. So if both of these over here happen to be solids and or liquids, then we wouldn't have C and D. We wouldn't have a numerator at all. So we would just hold that. We would just mark that with a 1. So 1 over. But you'll need to read the states. And as long as you have gases or aqueous, then those substances are included in the equilibrium law equation. The reason being that the number of gas or a gas, right, can have a number of particles, moles of a gas in a certain volume. So you can calculate a concentration there by having the number of moles in volume. And the same thing applies to a solute dissolved in a solvent. But if you have a solid, that's a pure substance. If you have a liquid, that's a pure substance. And if a pure substance has a fixed composition. It's not variable. When there's two components in, in the aqueous solution, the, vari the concentration is variable. For a gas, it takes the volume of its container, so that concentration can vary. More moles in the same volume makes it more concentrated, or change the volume and you change the concentration. And so for the, that reason, only gases and aqueous substances are included in the equilibrium law equation. So here's a couple of examples. Go ahead and write the equilibrium law equation for A and B here. Then check back with the video. Okay, so you'll notice here that I put water vapor as a product in the numerator raised to the exponent 2 because of this coefficient of 2. And then I'm dividing by the concentration of H2 squared because of the balancing coefficient of 2 multiplied by the concentration of O2. All gases, they all show up in the equation. Now for part B here, I notice that water is a liquid, so omit the water. No solids or liquids go into the equilibrium law equation. So the ammonium ion times the hydroxide ion over ammonia gas. Okay, now in our first video, we talked about equilibrium position, and I introduced this concept of K there. Well, that's what we're calculating in today's lesson is K. 
So just a brief, you know, three examples here, A, B, C, just to practice interpreting the value of K. So you may want to look back to your notes from the first lesson. Look at the exponent here, 91. Remember Avogadro's constant with an exponent of 23? Remember how incredibly, unimaginably large that value was? Well, K is many, many, many times larger than that, an exponent of 91. So for this reaction, that's the value of K. So would you expect there to be low concentrations of the reactants at equilibrium and high concentration of the product? high concentration of the reactants at equilibrium and low concentration of the products, perhaps approximately equal, what would you expect with a high value of K? Remember, K comes from the equilibrium law calculation equation here, which is products over reactants. So you have a quotient being calculated from K, and if, if you want to think of it loosely, concentration of products over concentration of reactants, right? Of course, their exponents are involved. But essentially, if this answer, if the value of K is huge, then we must have very, very, very large concentration of CO2 at equilibrium. Essentially, that's a complete reaction. How about the decomposition of water at 1,000 degrees Celsius? Look at the exponent here. That's pretty small, right? Pretty small. So what does that mean? K is much less than 1 here. Very small. Whereas over here, K was much greater than 1. So when K is very, very small, that means our numerator here must have been very small and our denominator very large. So the concentration of the reactants, very large. So we're expecting a very, very high concentration of that H2O gas and very little of the H2 and O2 at equilibrium. Okay, part C. K is basically equal to 1 here. So what does that tell us? Well, that the concentration of all those reactants is approximately equal to the concentration of the products. So, it's important that you can interpret the value of K. All right, so how do we actually obtain the value of K? Well, it depends what information you've been given, but generally you can write a balanced equation to describe the equilibrium system. Often that's provided in the question. And then write the equilibrium law equation that you've just learned to do, and then substitute the equilibrium concentrations. Now remember, concentration comes from a calculation of moles over volume, so be prepared to do that if the equilibrium concentrations are given, with, given in terms of their moles in the volume. Okay, so at 900 Kelvin, this K right here is Kelvin for temperature, 2.0 moles of ammonia, 0.36 moles of nitrogen gas, and 0.70 moles of H2 are present in a 2 liter flask at equilibrium. Oh, so we're being given the number of moles of each substance in that particular volume, right, at equilibrium. So we can use the moles and the volume, moles and volume, moles and volume, to calculate the concentrations at equilibrium. And then we can calculate K. So anticipating that we're going to be substituting equilibrium concentrations, we better calculate them first. So the concentration at equilibrium of the NH3 is going to come from N over V. So 2.0 moles divided by the 2.0 liters, 1.0 moles per liter. We can do the same thing for N2 and H2. Okay, so you can see here that the concentration of the various entities are now known at equilibrium. So we can write the equilibrium law equation and then substitute our values. So go ahead and write the equilibrium law equation for this equilibrium system as written. 
Okay, so you'll notice I did products over reactants and raised the concentrations to the exponents equivalent to their balancing coefficients. Now we substitute the equilibrium concentrations that we calculated here and, and then calculate K. Okay, so K in this case equals 0 0.0077. Now just to comment about units. K, we do not write the units for K. The value of k is significant because of its size, because of its magnitude. You'll recall what we did up here when we interpreted the size of k and what that told us about the concentrations of reactants and products. So sometimes those moles per liter would cancel out and sometimes they wouldn't, but we never write units for the equilibrium law constant because it's the magnitude of that number that is significant for us. Okay, moving on. Looking at k and k primed. So you'll notice that these two equations are reciprocals or reversed, um, reverse of each other. So in one case, the ammonia decomposing is the forward reaction. Uh, and in the second case, it's the synthesis of ammonia that is the forward reaction. So they're exactly reverse equations of one another. So if you're to write I'm asking you now to go and write an expression for k for each equation. So go ahead and do that. Okay, so I've written an expression for k of the first equation with products over reactants and the same for the second equation. So my question to you is, since these two equations are related and that one is the reverse of the other, perhaps these equations for k are related. So can you see a mathematical relationship between these two expressions? If we try to add them, well, we're adding fractions and they do not have a common denominator. Same with subtraction. What about multiplication? What happens if we multiply k times, I'm going to call this k prime just to distinguish between the first k. So if we were to substitute our equation for k, just like that, and then multiply by k primed. So k times k primed. Can you see that when we multiply that these concentrations are going to cancel, numerator and denominator? And so in fact, we're left with 1. And so the significance here is that when you have two equations, two systems, right, and one is the reverse of the other, then their equilibrium constants multiply to equal 1, which if you isolate, if let's say you know k and you're looking for k primed, you'll see that the k's are reciprocals of one another. So this equation can be rearranged. And the idea is that if you know one of the values of k, then you can determine k prime. Or if you know k primed, you can determine k. So let's go back to our example where we calculated the value of k right here. Okay, at 900 Kelvin. Notice the equation was the first one. The ammonia decomposing is the forward reaction. All right, so what we're saying here is that k equals 0 0.0077. All right, so my question to you is then, what is k primed? So if we know k, can we determine k primed? And sure we can. k primed, going back to the formula we just derived, is 1 over k. So we just take the reciprocal, 1 over 0 0.0077. And so k primed equals 130. So that relationship can be used when you know the value of k for one reaction and use that reciprocal relationship if you're looking for k for the reverse reaction. And that's it.